All right, well, this morning, the message is promises are forever. And the start off with Joshua chapter 23, verse 24. And you know in all you and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one thing has failed of all the good things which the Lord your God spoke. So Joshua is receiving this or giving this declaration uh, and receiving it from the Lord, but he's declaring it to the people, uh, the people of Israel, the children of Israel, that not one good thing which the Lord spoke has he failed to do. And so when we're looking at promises are forever, that God has given us many promises. <laughs> and I, in fact, I was astounded to find out that there's, a, there's an individual who has a book that, that he says there's 8,810 promises in the Bible. That's more than I thought. <laughs> but what Joshua says is that God has not failed in keeping one of them. So often we think of, you know, in our own selves, or people who have made promises and broke them. And um, the illustration that was... Uh, one that I read, it talked about how that James Bond, you know, Sean Connery, Connery, um, he, he made, he was, the, he was the James Bond guy for many years. And in 1971, he promised that that was his last film that he was going to do. Well, for me being James Bond. Well, what happened was he didn't make, he didn't have a great success in his other films. So he went back and made another <laughs> James Bond film. And the title was Never Say Never Again. <laughs> never Say Never Again. I don't think that was because of uh, his, him coming back or whatever. But So it's easy, it's, it's relatively easy for people to make promises and not keep them. Now, we are to be people of our word and that we are not to make promises knowing that we are going to uh, cancel them. <laughs> And I, I mentioned in Sunday school this, I was reading about this etiquette, and um, one, one of the etiquette things it was talking about was if you are in a situation where people are attacking you and things like that, we can ask them a question, well, is there something wrong with you? <laughs> so you have that type of thing is, is stopping it. But then there, there's another one, and I just went through my mind to what I was going to tell you, and it's gone. So... Uh, oh, one of the things is, if somebody keeps asking you out to lunch and they can't get the hint that you don't want to go, what you do is you invite, you have that individual invite two or three other people to go with you, and then at the last minute you cancel. <laughs> I thought, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty, that's, a neat, <laughs> that's etiquette? Okay. So then, then the, whole, the whole thing was, well, hopefully they'll get the idea that you don't want to go to lunch with them. No, so. Hey, I, I didn't. I didn't make that up. It was. It was written by some PhD. So, anyhow, our Lord doesn't change His mind, and our Lord does not want to cancel any of His promises in our life. So God is faithful. He is faithful in everything that He says and faithful in all that He will do. Um, it is. It's free. <laughs> it's free to us as the admonition or the declaration of God in his word to us. And so it also frees us up from the anxiousness and worry. So whenever we are worried, you know, the Bible says, why um, pray about everything, don't worry, don't be anxious, but pray about everything. And the, under the understanding is, well, we're focusing on what is the problem. What am I worried about? What am I anxious about? What am I thinking about? So we pin it down. <laughs> you know, we pin it down and we ask God to, and we pray about that situation. What is it we need to do? How is it that needs to be handled? What, what can we do about it? What, you know, what do I have to trust you for? You know, be specific about those things and um, allow God to give you his promise in your own life to help you deal with the difficulties that are in front of us. So when we harbor fears and needless aggravation, it isn't because God is not faithful, it's because we are doubting his ability to keep his promises and to act in our own life to keep us at peace. So 
the declaration is, don't do that. <laughs> you know, don't do that. Don't worry. Don't be anxious. Uh, find a promise. And as we said, there's 8,810. Um, there's a book that I, I, I may order <laughs> to, to, uh, uh, to uh, look at all these promises and, and write up some of them. But God never overpromises or underdelivers. God never overpromises or underdelivers. He always delivers on his promise, but he does it on his timetable. So as we are looking at promises are forever, I, I was thinking of it in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13. For example, there was God's promise to Abraham. Since there was no one greater to swear by, God took an oath in his own name. <laughs> so People, you know, you know, I swear on my mother's grave, or I, I swear by this, or swear, you know, they put um, put your hand on the Bible, and you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth will help you, God. Well, we swear on something that is greater, and something that we're going to be held accountable for. Now, I don't know if they still do that in the courtroom or not, but it used to be the, the common practice, and what was happening is, you are making an oath to something that is greater than you. Well, when God is making an oath, when God is providing promises, there's no one greater than himself. And so God promises on the authority of him being, of he being God. <laughs> there is none greater, there is none higher, and there is no authority greater than mine. So when God gives us a promise, then the whole intent is that he is going to carry it through. He is going to fulfill that promise. So God promises our um, stated in clear and simple terms. I shall supply all your needs. God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. It's a simple statement. It's not wordy. It's not confusing. God does not leave his people in uncertainty. He, you know, God says, I've prepared a place for you when he talks about heaven. Um, that the, the God has prepared a path for us in our life. God has a purpose and a plan for our lives. So uh, make straight the way of the Lord. So we have all these things that talk to us about God's working in our life and how that he is making and directing and bringing things together for us to follow him and to have the best life now <laughs> in our relationship with God. So there is none greater to swear by, and so we, we look at his word, the scriptures, we read them, and we find that it's important that we understand <laughs> the promises. We understand what God is trying to speak to us. Um, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he says uh, to Nicodemus, you know, you must be born again. And Nicodemus, a, a, a religious leader at the time and a scholar, he said, how can a man be born again when he is old? <laughs> So Jesus confronts us with questions and things that cause us to think and to also recognize that there are physical things. How can I be born when I'm old? And there are spiritual things that, that being born of the water and being born of the flesh and being born of the spirit. So there is this spiritual birth that Jesus is drawing Nicodemus to understand and also for us to understand. And so when we're when we're looking at the promises and we're looking at how God is working in our life, it, it's, it, it's a step-by-step -step process, and we can't, we, can't, uh, <laughs> we can't digest it all in one day. In one week, it takes a, a lifetime. Uh, but we begin where we're at, and our Sunday school lesson talked about the importance of a child. Uh, the disciples wanted to know who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and perhaps they were wondering, maybe it's Isaiah, maybe it's Moses, you know, who, who's greatest in the kingdom of God? And Jesus brings in a child and said, if we have faith as a little child, they are the greatest because they trust. And God is wanting us to trust him with our life and with our, 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 where we're going and what God has prepared for us. So what God promises, he will do. Um, and he, he says, and our need is to connect to God and receive the promises. Now, whenever, whenever I was putting this together, I was 
uh, trying to think, okay, now where do you go with it? <laughs> and, and I was reading about in uh, John chapter 15, where Jesus is talking about the vine and the branches. Now, to understand that the promises of God don't fail, the promises of God are forever, so how then do we connect with that? So I, I've looked at John 15, and Jesus says, I am the true grapevine. I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. So here's, the, here's an analogy that is helping us to understand that we have to be connected. <laughs> uh, if you're, uh, our computer was froze, if you're not connected to the Internet, it doesn't work. <laughs> so if you're not connected um, with, to the electricity, your power is not going to work. Well, in our lives, we have the connection spiritually with Christ. And so, to, to, you know, we don't, all, we don't understand, you know, many people don't, we you know how simplicity of electricity, you turn the switch on and the lights come on. I understand that. <laughs> well, what about where did it come from? Is it coal? Is it, is it uh, um, gas? Is it, you know, is it uh, turbines? You know, where did it come from and how did it get here? Well, we don't know all that, but we have enough faith to believe that if we turn the switch on, it works. Connection. Because when that electricity loses its connection to the source, it doesn't function. In our life, and in this, Jesus is telling us, he is the vine, we are the branches, and he's telling us if we lose our connection to the vine, we get cut off. There's no life in the vine if it's not connected. There's no life in the branch if it's not connected to the vine. The same life that is in the vine is the same life that's in the branch. If the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, he's going to quicken your mortal bodies. Meaning that when the, de when the trump of God shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. Why? Because we're connected. <laughs> the spirit that is in the vine, the spirit that is in Christ, is the same spirit that is in us. It is he who forgives us of our sins, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Promise. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Connection. <laughs> Cleansing. It's God doing the work. So, you know, and it's, it's that we have enough faith that if we turn the switch, the light comes on. If we have enough faith to believe that Jesus died for our sins, we confess our sins, we're forgiven. Be not anxious about every, anything, but in everything give prayer and supplication. So, turn the switch. <laughs> we have enough faith to believe that I do not need to be anxious. Why? Because I'm, I took what I was anxious about and I prayed about it. It isn't like, um, oh, well, it'll all be okay. <laughs> you know, well, trust in what? I don't know, it'll just be okay. You know, I, I trust that it'll all be, you know, well, what do you believe in? Well, I, I, you know, in faith, I believe in the stars. It was, I read the horoscope. You know, people are always finding things that they want to believe in, but God is telling us he is the foundation of our faith and we are to be connected to him. So we find that uh, I am the vine. I am the true grapevine. I, I've, I've seen pictures of grape harbors, these uh, grape growers like in California, and I know there's some, even, there's some around here in areas. But when you look at how that they trim them back, you know, I looked at them and I said, there's nothing left but this... <laughs> You know, this, this, vi this uh, vine, this, this, you know, the, the branches are all cut off. Well, what happens is that the branch, the, the vine grows, and it's all connected with wires, and then it sends out all of these branches, and then the branches will produce um, pods of grapes. Well, any of the branches that doesn't have fruit on it, the vine dresser will go through and cut them off because it ends up taking, robbing life from the other vines, the other branches that are producing fruit. If you want to have a big um, 
pumpkin or watermelon or whatever, you know, you plant it and it has a, a vine that goes out and there's all these uh, buds on it, you know, flowers on it. If you take all the bu flowers off but one, <laughs> you're going to have a big pumpkin or a big watermelon because all of the resources is going to go to all those flowers and all those little pumpkins or watermelons, it all goes to one, and it, and it has a lot of growth to it. So God's faithfulness allows us to have total confidence in every promise that he has written. It frees us up to be ourselves, and it frees us up from the grips of anxiety and worry. There could be no promise of deliverance from God unless we are connected to God. It's not because God isn't faithful uh, that we have these difficulties. It's because we are doubting his ability to intercede or interact or intervene in the situation. So even when things don't look good, it doesn't mean the answer isn't coming. It means that God is going to see us through. Whether I live or die, I belong to God. So no matter what happens in this life, I belong to God. So in this process of walking with the Lord, I have this understanding that God is with me, and he will never forsake me. He will never turn me away. He always hears me when I pray. So when we are praying, we are asking and being deliberate and being specific about what it is that we need, what it is that we want, because if we have this connection with God, if we have this connection with God, we have this understanding that God hears us when we pray. Not because we're special, but because we're connected. <laughs> the picture Jesus describes himself as the true grapevine and those who have become his followers as the branches. So when the followers remain attached to him as the source of life, they produce fruit. So we produce fruit as we stay connected to the vine. So the, how do we stay connected? Well, the spiritual fruit means developing godly character. Godly character is not being perfect. It's allowing God to help us develop the character of his, his character in us. And the connection, well, verse 2 says, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit. So God's cutting is those who are dead, but they just haven't fallen off the vine. They don't produce fruit. They're, they're just hanging on. It's like um, one individual said, the hurricanes and b winds and storms that come, that's God's pruning process for trees. <laughs> that where the limbs are dead or weak, God God prunes the trees by, you know, breaking them off. Well, and then he also says here that the, 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 the branches that never produce or have quit producing fruit are those who no longer have the spiritual life in them. They have died on the vine. They have not allowed the spirit that is in the, 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 the life that is in the spirit that is in the vine make it into the branch. I remember when, whenever we first built our house, I, uh, I planted trees, you know, around, around the house. And there was like three or four of them. And they were, um, they were ornam ornamental pear trees, something that, yeah, some kind of, they didn't bear fruit. <laughs> they were just ornamental pears fruit or whatever. And uh, they blossomed pretty, but they didn't, they didn't have any pears on them. But I remember I put this tree in, you know, you, you buy it and you go through and you look at these, you know, Lowe's or Home Depot or one of those places and you buy this tree and you go through all the pl parts of planting it. And then our granddaughter came and she wanted a twig. So she's breaking this <laughs> this tree that I just planted, and she's breaking the limbs off of it. And it's like, no, no, don't do that. And she's got it all bent over and broke, you know. And I'm like, oh, I just bought this tree, you know. So <laughs> what I did was, being the horticultural person that I am, 
Um, I got the, I, I went and I, I, you get, you can get this, um, oh, there's a fabric and then there's also some, it's almost, I'm going to call it glue, but it's not glue, but it, it, it seals the, the tree and you can put it back together, put a, put a band-aid on it, so to speak, and let it, let it grow and it'll grow back. My tree did grow, that limb did grow back, that branch did grow back, but it had a crook in it, you know. <laughs> it was broken one time and it was healed. So that was, it almost was disconnected from the, the, the trunk of the tree. But even though it had broken, even though it had problems, the life was still in the, 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 the life was still connected. The branch was, the outer part of the branch was still connected to the source. And in our life, we want to be connected to the source. So, the, when those who are lost, they've lost their love for Christ, they've lost their lasting faith in Christ, the Father finally cuts them off. So those are the branches that have died, that there's no more life in them. This means that they are separated from a life-giving relationship with God. And God doesn't want that to happen. God doesn't shut off the, the, the life to the branch. It's the branch decides. We choose. Choose this day whom you will serve. That's what Joshua says to the children of Israel. Choose this day whom you will serve. And it, it doesn't mean that... There are no difficulties. Difficulties come, difficulties go, but our faith remains constant. That God is going to take care of us. God is going to see us through the difficulty. The godly character that comes from being attached to Christ cannot be formed in the branches that are dead to the life that Jesus would give them. So we find that we are drawn to the things of God. We're drawn to the scriptures. We're drawn to church. We're drawn to praying. We're drawn to reading and, you know, taking the things of God personally. And we're wanting to learn and grow. And so we find that that is the life that is continuing to flow into the vine, uh, the, the, to the branches that come from the vine. So when people are out of contact, <laughs> they lose life. So the fruitful branches, they produce fruit. They are those who have life in them because of their connection with the vine. They have a connection to the vine and there is life in the vine. They have an enduring faith in the love of Christ. If we can understand the character of Christ, the character of God, if we can understand that, we begin to understand what God means and what he means to us. You know, um, I was reading about um, walking with God, and, and, and you, we find that some of the first <coughs> prayers in, in Genesis were about, you know, Adam and Eve walking with God. They weren't, they weren't necessarily words that we would say, our Father who art in heaven, you know, we think of that as a prayer. And it is a prayer, but we know that the first prayers or the first were, were, commu were, were communion, were friends with friends. So the character of God is that he wants to be our friend, that we are a friend of God. Now, it doesn't mean we manipulate him or he manipulates us. That's not friendship. His friendship is one that he loves us and wants only the best for us. So as we have this friendship with God, we have this understanding that he loves us. He who is greater loves he who is lesser, us. He is greater. We are the lesser. He loves us. Then, you know, promises are forever. God, he who is greater, makes promises to us who are the lesser. <laughs> and so what he's promised is that he will, he will allow his spirit to dwell with us. And the life that is in the vine the life in the branch. The life that is in Christ is the life that is in you. The purpose that God has for your life from the very beginning before the world was created, he knew you, formed you, and he had a plan and a purpose for you. So he's always desired that connection between you and the vine. He's always wanted us to be his friend and walk with him. Now, 
Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. It's one of the, oh, there's only one other, well, there's m maybe two others, but the, there's two basically that we know that were just taken. They didn't die. Enoch was one in the sense that he walked with God and that he and God had a, a spiritual journey together that was unbroken. And one day, he and God, he just walked right on into heaven. <laughs> and then the other is Eli Elijah. And Elijah is, uh, he's this prophet of God. And everybody knows he's going to go to heaven that day. And the, the prophets are following him. And Elisha is, is kind of his understudy. Elisha is following him. And, he, you know, Elijah takes off his mantle, strikes the water. And the water parts. And he, go, he and Elisha walk across the water, and, and they go on, on out into the desert. So Elijah asked Elisha, what is it that you want from me? And, and Elisha says, I want a double portion. Basically, I, I want double what you have. And Elijah says, basically, I, can, I don't know if I can give that to you, but if you see me go, God, that means God is going to give you what you ask. And so the horses come from heaven, you know, they separate Elijah and Elisha, the chariot, the fire, and he goes up into heaven. Elijah just <laughs> right on into heaven, and what falls to the ground is Elijah's mantle. And so Elisha picks up the mantle, goes back to the river, <laughs> strikes the water, it separates. He goes, meaning that God's spirit came upon Elisha just as much as it was on Elijah. So, and they were both great prophets in the Old Testament. Well, move that to where we are at in our life. That the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is um, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is there to lead us into all truth, to guide us in our relationship with God, to help us understand the scriptures. And so God has given to us his Holy Spirit. And his Holy Spirit is there as we read the scriptures, as we pray. It helps and we grow in our understanding of what God has for us. And it's important that fruit grows. Fruit grows. Fruit is harvested. Fruit grows. <laughs> So the, the, the branch that bears fruit continues to bear fruit. Now, the, the message that I had was about Galatians, where um, Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, meekness, kindness, and long-suffering. Well, what we have there is the connection to God the connection to the branch, the, the vine, is God's love is in the, the love that is in the vine is the love that is in the branch. The forgiveness that is in the vine is the forgiveness that is in the branch. The love that is in the vine is the love that is in the branch. So we see that the connection with God is that his love, his joy. And maybe next week we'll talk about all the, the each of those and their, um, what they mean and what, the, what they are implying in, their, in our relationship with God. But it means that we are connected. Just as there is forgiveness in the uh, vine, there is forgiveness in the branch. We forgive those and just as God has forgiven us, we forgive those who trespass against us, those who have missed the mark in our life. So everything that is in the vine is in the branch. And what the branch is learning is that we must draw the strength from the vine. And no matter how we've been broken and twisted, we kind of put it all back together, and God will grow us <laughs> and develop us and that tree that had that crook in it, it it's about 40 feet tall now. And uh, it, it's, you know, that branch is big around, still has a little, 
a little crook in it, but it's a, it's a way to let us know the life that was in the, in the trunk of the tree went through the vine and out into the leaves. The, the life that is in Christ is the life that is in us. And we don't know everything, but we're in a process of growing and developing and allowing the fruit of God's love, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, his joy, his peace, his long-suffering. All these things are growing in our life. We don't have them all yet, and we're still growing. So allow that understanding that all the promises that God has for us, they're forever. <laughs> and they, they do not diminish with time. Amen? Promises are forever. Fruitful branches. That's what we are. Fruitful branches. Now, let's allow ourselves, to people pick the fruit. What kind of fruit do they get? Oh, that's sour grapes. <laughs> no, I don't have any sour grapes. I just have grapes that don't taste too good sometimes, you know. <laughs> but reality, the 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 life that is in the vine is the life that is in the branch. The life that is in Christ is the life that is in us. And we're still growing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the good things that you've done for us. And we thank you for how that you watch over and keep us. We thank you for your word, which is the light to our path. And you continue to grow with us as we walk with you. We walk with you in everyday life. Lord, we have our needs, we have our prayers. God, we make those requests to you. Guide us in our prayers. Guide us in our expectations. Guide us in how that we can grow and become more like you. Lord, it's our dependency upon you that makes the difference. Let that spirit that dwell in Christ dwell in us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.